Welcome to the ongoing series of um, videos post-coronavirus on uh, sociological theory. So this is a, uh, a video directly aimed at my undergraduate students who are reading Eric Fromm's Escape from Freedom. Uh, graduate students are welcome to view this. It's more optional, but, um, but these are themes that we would have hit more directly in the last week of class had we had it. So, um, so uh, Fromm's book is one of my favorites. Um, it took me a long time to actually like it, but, uh, but in a long lifetime, I've found few books that actually sort of summarize uh, the basic problems of modern society and the relationship between capitalism and, and, and what Fromm is going to call social character, a concept that he's getting actually from, um, from the, the Freudian uh, analyst uh, Wilhelm Reich social character. So we all know what a personality structure is um, uh, or a, 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 a personality disorder, right? There's all kinds of them. Uh, um, but uh, what Fromm emphasizes, what Wilhelm Reich emphasized, is the way in which um, personalities are structured, character is structured by uh, by the society in which you live. So, so social character refers to a kind of modal or, or, or sort of type of personality that emerges in a particular form of, of, uh, of society. I've written about peasant societies uh, with, a, uh, with a former student of mine, uh, um, uh, Tony Feldman. We've written about the way in which peasant societies tend to generate something approximating contemporary psychotic characters. Um, and uh, Fromm is really trying to make sense of the difficulties that people have living lives of freedom, of individuality, of sort of self-chosen um, um, uh, thriving in, in, in late capitalism. He was trying to cope with the rise of fascism. Uh, he was literally chased out of, of Germany as the Nazis took over. The book itself was written, um, I think, in 1940 is when it was first published. And, um, and so it's, it's a document of trying to make sense of the, um, of the reasons why um, modern people rejected something like democratic regimes and, and uh, escaped into the arms of fascism. Okay, so uh, a very, very important book. So let's just just sort of do a quick overview. This will be part one of a two-part uh, 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 video series. In this part, we're gonna we're gonna focus in on only one of the three escapes from freedom. We're gonna emphasize uh, uh, authoritarianism, and then we'll follow that up with a little bit more discussion of authoritarianism in the next video. And then uh, we're gonna talk about destructiveness and automaton conformity, the other two escapes that he emphasizes in, in this work. Okay, so. Um, so just to kind of give a summary, what Fromm is doing is he's trying to theorize the conditions for democracy, for political democracy, and for people, um, what are the conditions necessary to generate uh, subjects, people capable of embracing and thriving in a democratic uh, condition. Again, nothing to do whatever with the Democratic Party, everything to do with the concept of a political structure and a society uh, that operate in a democratic way. So he distinguishes between two kinds of freedom, negative freedom and positive freedom. And, and again, this is going to be a theme that is at focus of one of the chapters, and then it's going to be a theme that comes up throughout the book. So negative freedom refers to, I guess, um, what, what, what you would kind of think of as the resultant of something like the, the imposition of civil rights. I don't like that because rights comes up. But it really is a cutting off of an individual from what Fromm calls primary ties. You lose connection to your village, your clan, your tribe, um, you know, your totem, your kin, your family. You lose connection to the mother. You lose connection to a sort of a world of social contacts that... Um, in, in which you are held from all sides, you have similarity of psychic structure, similarity of experience, and so on with all the people around you. And so when you're living in a world, uh, a traditional society, say again, a village, a clan, a tribe, you are um, really unfree, but you're at least supported, you know who you are, you know where you should be, and so on. And, uh, and so you're chained down. So, uh, so traditional people don't have freedom, right? They sort of, but, but, but they do have something like security. So negative freedom is the sort of the severing of these chains, right? Releasing people from, say, caste, gender, class roles, those kinds of things, cutting them off from the world of primary social contacts and throwing them out into the world, right? So think of every folk tale, every fairy tale you've ever read. It's always about someone leaving the village, leaving the family, and going out into the world. That's negative freedom, right? So um, negative freedom 
uh, is negative because it, it's merely cutting the ties that were binding you to a, to a secure uh, traditional society. Positive freedom goes beyond that. I've got muscles here and something like a tool of a calling or tool of profession or a vocation. Positive freedom refers to um, psychologically a desire for the freedom of the self and others. It's always rooted in this idea that my freedom is anchored in other people's freedom. If other people are free, it increases my capacity to be free, that kind of thing. There's a basic trust in the superiority of, of the many, right? Um, and many minds can make better decisions. Uh, superior decisions come about from a kind of division of labor, of mental discourse, and, and um, uh, of, of mental thinking and discourse, and so on. In other words, good groups, good uh, good procedures, Robert's Rules of Order, parliamentary procedure down here, can actually generate um, uh, something like a good society. So. Um, so positive freedom then is the desire for what Fromm calls potency in life, the capacity to engage in work, love, and play in a wholesome, hearty manner uh, where you are um, self-choosing um, the places in which you are going to expend your life energy. So your value as a human being is, is um, something that you nurture on your own and then deploy on your own to uh, realize uh, your own self-chosen end. So you sacrifice ultimately for the things that you self-choose, right? So the ultimate sacrifice is where you literally will die into um, work, love, play in the, the things that you care about, right? All right. So, and then again, it, and one thing about positive freedom is it's always reciprocal. So the desire isn't for yourself to be free and others to be unfree, but there's this notion of universal freedom, right? That other people's freedom provides the necessary conditions for my own and my freedom provides the necessary conditions for others. So, Again, you're, you're, you're no longer just sort of cut off negatively from primary ties, but you have the positive potency to go out into the world and to accomplish um, self-chosen ends. Negative freedom, uh, just really quick here. This is an image uh, that I use to teach Lacan. So this is Lacan's moment of castration, uh, the moment in which a, a subject here, a child, is separated from the mother. So the mother is sort of the... Um, the, the, the primary tie, uh, the source of both uh, uh, um, organic uh, pleasures as well as psychic identification. Um, the young child thinks of themselves as the apple of the mother's eye, the, the imaginary phallus, as it were, and that at a certain moment in life, one is cut away from this, right? This is the moment of castration. In modernity, something like a school or something like an apprenticeship or something like that rips literally cuts or rips the child away, separates the child from the world of primary ties, right? So you leave behind the mother, you leave behind the family, you leave behind your room, your toys, uh, and so on, and you're, you're grabbed by society and installed somewhere else where you're learning potency, where you come into possession of capabilities to be self-managing and self-creating, where you yourself can then choose your work, your play, your love, and, and, and live in, in um, something like a positive life. So this is the negative side of that, negative freedom, where you're being cut away by society from the primary ties. So you lose security, uh, which is very, very frightening, but the gain comes later with the capacity to work, uh, love, and play in uh, self-chosen ways. Okay, so really fast imagery of what Fromm is going to talk about. So Fromm's basic argument is, is that fascism has resulted from a kind of universal, not a, a generalized escape from freedom, right? That there are people who have a social character that isn't capable of bearing the burdens of freedom. There's a fear of freedom and hence an escape from it. And so his argument is that there are three basic ways to escape from freedom. One of them is authoritarianism, sort of depicted here in this little, uh, you know, cobweb sketch of mine, um, where you're, 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 in a world of, of kind of sadomasochism, right? So you are sadistically submitting to power above while masochist, excuse me, you're sadistically kicking down to those below while masochistically submitting to those above. So it's a power structure, an authority structure, and where each individual ceases to strive at, uh, along self-chosen pathways, but instead becomes part of um of a kind of sadomasochistic uh, um, uh, structure, that's authoritarianism. So it's the giving up of, of freedom, the escape from freedom, into something like uh, sadomasochistic strivings into uh, structures of authority. And this is going to be one of his primary framings for explaining uh, uh, um, uh, the rise of fascism. 
The second type, uh, this is an image of, of destructiveness, which has a multi-sided element to it. So in the beginning of the book, he writes about uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the emergence in the post-war era of, of weapons of, of mass destruction, of, of true weapons of mass destruction, you know, planet-destroying uh, weaponry. And so he, he writes about, you know, this desire um, not to insert oneself into a structure of authority where you have sadomasochistic strivings, but he actually calls it uh, necrophilia, right? Cultural necrophilia, where you seek to escape from the uh, struggles of life uh, into the certainties of death, right? So this is an escape from freedom. So it includes everything from... Um, um, you know, uh, you know, nuclear explosion. Uh, 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 you know, uh, sub ultimately submission to the dead. The dead's going to be important. Worshiping the dead, um, uh, being part of a power structure that is essentially a weapon of death. Militaries, for example, would probably fit here. So having a society that revolves around the dead and, and generating death and so on, uh, destructiveness. More on that as we go. Okay, and then the third type is automaton conformity, but we'll we'll deal with that next time. Okay, so let's just really fast walk through some of the beginnings of the book. So in the forward to the book from um, uh, says that uh, uh, you know he he views modernity as a very high achievement, right? That our modern world of of uh, of the the three great things, right? Um, that he writes about at the beginning, there are three great aspects, sort of to. Uh, uh, to modernity, it's uh, uh, um, is that it generates something like, um, yeah, this would be on, this is not in the preface, but it's later uh, on page two, generates economic liberalism, uh, political democracy, religious autonomy, and personal individual individualism and personal life, right? That these are the kind of high accomplishments of, of modern society. So whatever the negative side of capitalism, these are the positive things that walked into uh, society uh, uh, with capitalism. So, 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 so capitalistic modernity generates these positive things, a high achievement, right? Um, but, on, but, but it also generates uh, negative things. So he summarizes his argument in the book on, in the preface, um, um, page X, right? And he says, it is the thesis of this book that modern man, sorry for the gendered language, freed from the bonds of pre-individualistic society, freed from villages, clans, and tribes, um, which simultaneously gave him security because it anchored, you know, people down um, and limited him, right? Constricted by the confines of being a peasant um, or a tribal member, um, has not gained freedom in the positive sense of the realization of his individual self, that is, the expression of his intellectual, emotional, and sensuous potentialities, work, love, play. Instead, freedom uh, has brought independence and rationality, but it has made him isolated and therefore anxious and powerless. Uh, so this isolation is unbearable. One of the themes that, 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 that keeps coming up here is that being lonely being morally lonely, especially, not even lonely where you're not around other people, but where you feel morally isolated from people, that you're vibrating along a different moral, uh, uh, to, you know, to a different moral tune, something like that. Very, very troubling. And that that is something that's unbearable, makes you anxious, you feel powerless, uh, and then you seek alternatives, you seek to escape from the burden of freedom into new dependence and submission, right? And, and there it is. And so, the, the burdens of negative freedom are too great. You can't handle it. And so you then try to strive to get rid of freedom, escape from it into authoritarianism, destructiveness, or automaton uh, conformity, right? Okay, so that's in, in the preface. Um, you know, uh, from views uh, late 20th century society as an even darker period, you know, uh, in the preface, he writes about this then, then early 20th century society, and it really is all due to sort of the growth of the powers of society, including nuclear weaponry and the internet and those kinds of things. He writes about it as cybernetic society. We would think of it today as something like, you know, information technology, the internet, and so on. But that the, that the scale of society has grown massive, um, just really fast. I was born in 1965. I'm 55 years old right now. There were 3 billion people on the planet in 1965. There are, what, pushing 8 billion now. Um, so that just the simple scale, uh, the size of institutions, right, uh, has really grown. The power of institutions has grown. And, and so we're basically uh, in the problem that Wilhelm Reich called little men, right, that we don't really feel that we have the capacity to thrive on our own. We feel shrunk. And then the, 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 the 
power of, again, nuclear weaponry in particular, to wipe out humanity at any moment is just something that really creates darkness in a way that wasn't quite prevalent, uh, present before. Okay. Um, and then what does Fromm think might help to improve our chances? Uh, on page XVI, he really writes about developing potency and comfort uh, with freedom. And so, uh, so there it is. That's 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 the essence of it. All right. So, chapter one: um, What is freedom? Uh, again, to from it's it's uh, freedom is um, again our, our three things that we just pointed out. Page two. Yeah. So it is economic liberalism, political democracy, uh, religious autonomy, and uh, uh, and um, and. Yeah, and culture of individualism and personal life. That that's really the essence of freedom. So the capacity to be a self-rolling uh, wheel or a, a, a self-defining um, uh, person, right? Okay, and then what features of modernity reflect our move to freedom? Uh, he goes through and, and again, he writes about politics, the, the elimination of serfdom, uh, the no longer need to submit to a master. You know, we wind up with as legal subjects, those kinds of things. So he talks about that. Um, why was World War I a tragedy that, that moved us away from freedom? Um, again, he really, it's, it's this, the, um, yeah, um, yeah, page two, um, it just revealed that human beings are in structures and in historical moments beyond their control, and so you get that sense of, 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 um, of powerlessness uh, just became really uh, strong and prevalent. Uh, and then let's go on. Uh, why did totalitarianism arise? Also on page two and three, it had to do again with the with he claims the the um, uncomfortable that people were uncomfortable. Right, millions of Germans were eager to surrender their freedom as their fathers were to fight for it. That instead of wanting freedom, they sought for ways of escaping it because of you know the the problems of of the economy and of living uh, again a kind of self-determined life okay so again the burdens of freedom were too great and people sought to get rid of it um uh page six again he's a freudian so are humans rational and enlightened well they can be but it takes a particular kind of society to generate a social character of reason and rationality and humanism and um, and what Freud revealed in in his work was the was the unconscious. So page seven, he really talks about that Freud's contributions to the understanding of humanity. Um, we'll just take a look here at my little drawing that of of of, of Freud <laughs> engaged in uh, in psychoanalysis. Right. So what Freud did with his patients is he had them um, lay on a couch, basically out of sight, and. Um, Asked them to uh, follow the prime directive or the fundamental rule, which is that you do not edit. Uh, um, uh, you, you speak uh, of your uh, desires, of your consciousness without editing. And by doing that, um, you would gain access not only, you'd become kind of somnambulant, uh, almost hypnotized to a degree, and you would project out the unconscious. It would negate, it would kind of dim the light of consciousness. Uh, and by dimming the light of consciousness, unconscious desires would become visible. And so the analyst was the person who was an expert in understanding the irrational um, um, other, the irrational second subject that's inside of of human beings, the unconscious, right? That includes all of the irrational things and the, the disavowed pleasures and so on, the disavowed desires and worries and so on, okay? So Freud uh, helped us see how, um, again, that even in the midst of a culture of rationality and reason, you can wind up with people being uh, um, uh, very irrational because of the unconscious. So again, the big terms here, the unconscious, the notion of suppressed drives, the idea of sublimation, um, that um, being a productive person in Freud often means that you're sublimating your desires. So you have an, in, uh, a socially unacceptable desire that gets sublimated into something uh, positive. So you have a desire to dominate others and then gets sublimated in desire to compete in in, in a way that benefits not just you, but other people as well. Uh, the concept of neuroses, the Oedipal conflict, these are kind of well-known terms. Won't go into them now. 
But Fromm embraces sort of Freud's essentially psychoanalytic structure. He claims that Freud, though, was really trying to understand, he was a clinician, so he was trying to understand individuals' relationship to their own psychic structure and their sort of uh, exchanges with nature and with their own organic self. Fromm is much more interested in what he calls, uh, again, character structure, the social character of human beings. So really fast, Wilhelm Reich um, I wrote a great book called Character Analysis, uh, in about 1922 or something like that, 23, um, in which he tried to understand the way in which society patterns, society shapes, society sets the conditions that determine the way that human beings uh, uh, are are released into the world. So the basic idea is, we won't go into all of this uh, too much, but uh, page 15, um, character structured needs versus biologically structured needs. We talked about this a little bit in the, in the video on, on Butler that um, instead of viewing human beings as a kind of release of innate potentialities or a kind of release of natural drives into the world, uh, Reich and, and Freud really too, but, but Fromm especially, emphasizes how society creates a kind of character that we don't have instincts that dominate us. Our instincts are negated, right? That we're born very, very premature. And because we're born premature, we're not instinctually driven animals, but instead we depend upon acculturation or socialization to give us a uh, form. And that, uh, and that, and that, that process of psychic development, of social development, uh, uh, patterns us. And so this is the replacement to biologically structured needs by character structured needs, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, so Fromm's notion is that uh, is that because we're fundamentally social, we can't become cells without society, and that we can't sustain ourselves as cells without society, that our fundamental need is to avoid aloneness, right? To avoid aloneness it's on page 17. And then he distinguishes um, uh, between physical aloneness, which is a problem, right? Being shunned and, and put out into the world alone from other people who provide comfort and excitement and other things, but also moral aloneness, where you're vibrating to a moral structure that's different from those around you and are rejected or feeling alone as a result of having a different uh, mentality. So, you know, being someone who opposed the Nazi regime in the middle of Nazis, you're morally alone. You might be surrounded by Nazis, but because you are not one, right, you are uh, separated off from other people. Therefore, you're very insecure and very uh, frightened and so on, right? Okay, page 19. Um, why do we need others? Uh, there's objective and subjective needs for other people. Other people um, meet our biological needs, right? Um they prevent us from being alone and so on. We can't actually survive or uh, objectively without people, but we also need to develop that sense of self and maintain a sense of, uh, of self, uh, again, that we're, that we're to keep us from being morally morally alone, right? So, so again, this, this is uh, really emphasizing with great strength the idea that we are fundamental um, uh, people of, of society, people of culture, that we need other people. And therefore, uh, you know, it runs very counter to the culture of individualism that dominates in America, uh, the American, you know, libertarian West in particular, South Dakota, the, the state I come from, the strong assertion of libertarian individualism. Well, Fromm's running counter to that, that human beings need each other, and, um, and that this is sort of the basis then of his work. On page 21, then, he says that... Um, um, the main theme of this book is that man, again, sorry for the gendered language, but that humans, the more they gain freedom in the sense of emerging from the original oneness with humans and nature, and the more they become an individual, they have no choice but to unite uh, themselves with the world in spontaneity of love and productive work, right? That's the positive side. If you get positive freedom, if you develop these potentialities that, that modern society, that capitalism even made possible, is that you develop spontaneity of love and productivity of work. And if you can't do that, then you're going to seek a kind of security by such ties with the world as destroy freedom and the integrity of the individual self. You're going to escape it. So if you can embrace freedom, you're going to have uh, be able to love, to work, and to play with self-chosen uh, hardiness, right? If you can't do that, you're going to escape. So that's the problem of freedom. So uh, chapter two, he talks about uh, the emergence of individuals and the ambiguities of freedom. Again, positive and negative freedom. Um, again, the traditional, this is sort of a timeline of, uh, of, of history, periodized a little bit. Um, and this is low individualism. The, the vertical axis is low individuality and high individuality or individuation. 
how separated we are, how collective we are, right? Traditional societies, village clans, and tribes, very low levels of individualization. Uh, modernity creates the possibilities for high levels of individuation, huge numbers of professions, huge numbers of callings, huge numbers of people, clubs, activities, avocations, and hobbies, and so on. Um, and really capacity to choose uh, from a, an immense number of lifestyles and so on, right? So there's a lot of individuation possible. And so that's what this is sort of depicting. And then his claim is, is what the heck happens? Why, if this is true, that society generates, modern society, capitalism generates the possibility for high levels of individuation, why do people give it away and become automaton conformists, destroyers, and authoritarians, right? Okay, uh, fascists and so on. All right, let me see. So page 24, again, the primary ties to the mother uh, in immediate intimate relations, um, the village, the tribe of the clan, the church, that that's what the primary ties were. Most human beings from the time we first crawled out of the ooze until the first time that capitalism threw us into cities uh, lived in a kind of uh, permanent network of strong social ties that fixed our identity psychologically, fixed our economic uh, structure, limited our freedom, but at least gave us security, right? Uh, okay, and then, um, and then page uh, 28, as you get modern capitalism developing, you get the dialectics of freedom you get uh, greater levels of individuation, which is positive because that means you have greater levels of self-strength, which is good, um, but it also generates greater aloneness. And, individu uh, and, and so individuation gives you the capacity to be a self, but it also cuts you off from social ties of security. So if you're capable of, of developing strength and potency um, in, and self-strength, self then you're able to, again, love, uh, work. Uh, we should put play in there. Do these three things, and that that is going to increase your self strength. You need this positive feedback effect going, right? So that cultures uh, that support individuation, support individual uh, a thriving and, and flourishing, um, you know, generate people of love, of work, and of, 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 of satisfactory play. So they have all these productive outlets for their energy rather than destructive outlets for their energy. And then you that helps to build the kind of um, momentum for a good society. If you can't do that, or if the society doesn't support people in their individuality, then, um, then the aloneness dot predominates, which generates anxiety and fear, which generates a desire for submergence uh, 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 and, and de-individuation, getting rid of your individuation, going back into security. And, that, and, and then that leads to escape from freedom and authoritarianism, destructiveness, and automaton uh, conformity, right? Okay, so that's chapter two. Um, again, so, uh, so, yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, so you have your physiologically conditioned drives that were driven uh, forward by, say, thirst and hunger and, 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 and so on. Uh, and then we have social needs, moral and physical aloneness are the two things that we want to avoid. Isolation, what we want to avoid. We have the need for other people. And then we have these character structure needs. These are the things that result from a kind of warping of the human uh, subject. Um, and and um it can be good in the form of love or negative in the form of dependency, destructiveness, sadism, masochism, uh, uh, you know, per, uh, some sort of destructive uh, sensuality and so on. Okay, so um, page 28. Uh, so Freud's measures of mental health and modernity, the capacity to work, love, and play. Work, love, play, the three regions of life. And that people who find themselves uh, in, in clinics uh, uh, for mental disorders are generally disrupted in work, love, or play, or all of them, or, or, or more than one, right? All right, so the escape from freedom comes because the burdens are too great. It's difficult to do it. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so Fromm argues that, uh, again, it's not really in this text directly, but that uh, at this point, but that human beings are squeezed on two sides, all right? And that this creates the kind of existential anxieties that shape us uh, as beings in a way different from animals, right? So number one, we're born premature. So we can't survive as infants. None of us come out of the womb with the capacity to say earn a living as accountants, right? We have to go through a developmental process uh, before we can make money, right? We can't drive a truck at birth. So, um, so we're prematurely born. That puts us in incredible uh, connection to other people then who help us develop. And then two, we become aware of the transitoriness of life 
by watching other people we care about die. We ourselves can can flirt with death at times. And that, that means that we have, we have a long period of psychological and social development before we can be free. And then we can see that the decline and end is on the other side. The long grass snap is waiting for us. And so uh, this creates a kind of, you know, heightening, a temporality that's really heightened with anxiety. We all feel this. I'm 55. I'm feeling this on a daily basis, right? That there's just so much time left to accomplish work, love, and play. And that these are things that can't be put off because, again, the grass nap awaits. So, um, so, so again, these are things that must be dealt with in some way. So this leads to, again, an existent contemplation of the healthy person. We know that narcissists deny that they're going to die. We know that's one of the ways that narcissism becomes this kind of destructive character um, um, uh, uh, social character that that denies death and that and that then leads us to do all kinds of things that are uh, uh, that are negative as a result okay um, yeah so let's get rid of this so again page 34 is where it begins to differentiate positive freedom which he, what he calls freedom to do things versus negative freedom which is the freedom from so it's usually freedom from security and those bonds, those chains that kept us from being free. And then positive freedom is the freedom to, uh, again, love, work, and play. Those are the three regions of life. You have freedom to be self-chosen in love, self-chosen in work, and self-chosen in play. Instead of having someone choose, you know, uh, an arranged marriage to someone that you can't, uh, you know, that you never would have chosen. Uh, a, a working as a peasant like every other person around you. And then, you know, having only the kind of group activities of festival and carnival and so on that you can in engage and play in, right? Okay, so there's a dialectical relationship between positive and negative freedom, uh, between freedom from and freedom to. Love and work uh, as spontaneous production is a positive reconciliation of the self with society. You give back to society with your own particular gift, right? So if you have individuality, we know this is the positive part about classic liberalism. Being self-defined, following your own taste and talent leads one into a profession or a calling in which one can contribute the most, right? That you satisfy your way to maximum sacrifice to benefit a group, right? Okay, um, Okay, uh, so we'll kind of leave that. So uh, chapter three on freedom in the age of the Reformation, again, begins with this notion that medieval Christendom, um, you know, was really um, uh, limited in its, in, its in, in, in primary and and secondary freedom. Okay, let's just jump straight to then to chapter five, where Fromm begins to talk about what happens to people who escape freedom in a very particular form. So again, there are three types, authoritarianism, destructiveness, and automaton conformity. And uh, let's begin with the first one. He talks about um, uh, uh, authoritarianism. Okay, so... Um, all right, so, so again, we need to keep in mind the distinction between the unconscious rather than the conscious, and his argument is going to be that we can't understand authoritarianism by talking to people consciously. People often won't know why they're doing what they're doing, right? The basic idea of the complex uh, psychic structure, the complex model of the psyche that's part of psychoanalysis is the recognition that people are not... Um, uh, software programs, or we're, we're not we're not fully conscious of our of the wellsprings of action, but we often have those out of mind, and that we have to pay attention to the unconscious in order to explain why we do what we do and why others do what they do. Right. So, if you're going to explain why society is structured the way it does, you have to have access uh, to the unconscious because that's actually where the language and law of society are installed, and then people's consciousness is playing out a kind of system. Um, that you know that's out there so this is Lacan's great insight Freud uh, was there as well that the unconscious is actually the place where society is inside of the individual to a degree right okay so the conscious ego our conscious thoughts and our unconscious libido and the unconscious structure uh, of the linguistic structure uh, is here okay all right, so we have to distinguish between a normal and healthy human being and a neurotic. So the normal, healthy human being, again, is the person capable of work, love, and play, self-chosen, self-managed, self-directed. I satisfy my way to maximum sacrifice for the benefit of the group. The neurotic is the person who is incapable or, uh, or for whom it is impossible to engage in work, love, and play in a, in a uh, self-chosen way, right? So they fail in one of these dimensions, which le be, would lead them into uh, a clinical um, uh, experience, or if they don't get that, then they're driven into one of the forms of, dis of, of escape from freedom. All right. All right. So, um, 
So the central argument then, page 139, um, negative freedom is a burden and it leads to two responses, all right? So once you're cut free from the security of primary ties, you can either embrace your freedom positively with a spontaneous flow into love, work, and play. And this is a social thing. If society provides you with the foundation that supports your individuality, then you flow into those things almost naturally, right? A good education system, a good social welfare system, a good system of, um, of talent selection and taste selection that gets people into callings, professions, trades, um, in which, again, they can satisfy themselves en route to maximum sacrifice for the benefit of the group. Okay, so that would be embracing positive freedom. If you can't do that, then you compulsively manage your anxiety by escaping from freedom, right? And um, so all character uh, disorders really are compulsive escapes. That would be his argument, right? And there are three that he thinks are, are most important. You're again, authoritarian, destructive, destroyers, and uh, conformists. So authoritarianism. Um, Okay, uh, is defined as the, is the desire to fuse with somebody or something else to acquire strength. So you're cut off from the security of your primary ties and you feel weak and, in, and powerless. And so you're trying to fuse yourself, merge yourself with something powerful, right? Uh, so to compensate one for the strength that one is lacking. So you seek new secondary bonds uh, as, as chains or as anchors to replace the primary bonds that were severed, right? So you were cut free from the village, cut free from peasant life, you move to a city, and then you're seeking some structure to re-anchor you down, to chain you back down, because the burden of individuality is too much. So you join a political movement or some kind of, of um, um, you know, um, you know um, association, um, religious association that takes away your freedom, that tells you how to think, how to live, how to act, so that you don't have to have the burden of making these decisions for yourself. So you're reattaching yourself with these strong fixed bonds that take away the condition of, of, primary, of, of, of negative freedom by putting you back in a structure that, uh, that, that takes away the burden to self-manage. Okay. So page 141, he links us to sadomasochism, the striving for submission and domination. So sadomasochism, we know from, um, from Freud, even earlier than Freud, is that sadomasochism tends to be a, a single personality structure. So we think of sadism, the desire for domination over others, or the desire to humiliate others, the desire to control others, the desire to get someone to submit. We usually think that as a, as a separate disorder from masochism, the desire to be dominated, to be controlled, to, to be forced to submit. But what Freud found is that you never find sadism without masochism. One is going to be conscious, maybe the other unconscious, or one, one is going to be more prevalent in consciousness and the other more, more uh, uh, again, more repressed, but that they're going to go together. And so sadomasochism is a really uncomfortable, highly ambivalent character structure, um, again, that, 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 that Fromm is going to say um, is equal to authoritarianism, okay? So let's talk about masochistic strivings first. So these are feelings of inferiority, powerlessness, insignificance, that leaves one uh, that you feel uh, you feel inferior, insignificant, and um, it leaves one to to uh, um, yeah, where where you you display dependence instead of independence. You belittle, weaken, and humiliate the self. You tend to be non-assertive. Uh, you do not want um, what they want. Oh yeah, you take yourself out of competition. You take yourself out of of claims for resources that other people might want. You submit. Um, you submit to orders and fate and uh, outside forces, right? I'm powerless. I will be dominated by the forces around me. And one loses the capacity to feel, uh, to say I want or I am. Those kind of things go away, right? So life as a whole then is felt to be something overwhelming and powerful and external, right? The powers of life are external to the self and something that can't be mastered or controlled, in extreme form, one seeks self-injury and suffering, self-criticism, uh, compulsory rights, uh, intrusive thoughts, psychosomatic illness, right? There's a lot of this in, 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 in Freud's writings about masochism. You become accident-prone, you engage in cutting, burning, those kinds of things, right? 
All right. So if you're really strongly masochistic, it can lead to, again, clinical, uh, you know, needs for clinical interventions. You attack, alienate people on whom you depend, who then cut you off. And again, you're self-damaging, self-harming in some way. You have an internal saboteur, a kind of mafia, um, right? As though you're taking advice from an enemy. You act as though an enemy is driving you to do things that harm you, right? Okay. Page 142. There's conscious and unconscious masochism. Uh, masochism, is, masochism is often rationalized as love, as loyalty, as fate, as a, as a theology of suffering or a theodicy of suffering. You're engaging in this in order to, because God wants you to, you're engaging in, in it because suffering is good for the soul. Uh, suffering reduces your time in purgatory. Uh, those kinds of things, right? Love, uh, he has a nice analysis of love as essentially sadomasochistic attachment. And that that's one of the things that we teach uh, uh, children um, in um that romantic love often takes the form of a kind of sadomasochism. All right, then he describes sadistic strivings, which are the kind of the opposite appearance of a shared structure. So this is found within uh, the same person alongside masochism, hence sadomasochistic uh, structure. You try to force others to become completely dependent upon you. So instead of displaying dependence, you're displaying the power to make others dependent, rule over others, exploit others, use them, steal from them, um, disembowel them, ingest them. Anything that is usable in them, you take into yourself, incorporate into yourself. You're not doing it because you enjoy killing. You take, you're doing it because you enjoy incorporating and taking, having power over, right? And then power to destroy. It's going to differentiate the sadistic person from the, from the destroyer. This is a desire to uh, dominate, and the destroyer we're going to find has the desire to, to simply obliterate, right? Okay, you have the desire to humiliate and make others suffer. Uh, you desire to see them suffer uh, physically, mentally, hurt actively, humiliate people, place people in humiliating situations, those kind of things. So the sadist is trying to humiliate, to, to not just hurt people physically, but, but emotionally, socially, psychologically. Because being alone and isolated and, and um, disrespected is painful to people, um, you're trying to cause that pain in others. All right, so sadism is less conscious often than, than, than masochism. Masochism has that conscious sort of uh, legitimation where it's love, loyalty, or again, it's good for the soul. Very few parts of, 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 of religion or popular music tell us that sadism is good for the soul, right? So it's often you have a reaction formation, a rationalization, I know what's good for you, that kind of thing. It's a, it's a, it's a different, right? So, you're, so the masochist, uh, has the desire to be humiliated, punished. The uh, sadist has the desire to humiliate and punish. But because the, it goes together, um, it's, it's again, it's an ambivalent uh, process. Okay. All right, so the whole list of rationalizations for sadism on page 143. But 144, the sadist is dependent upon the object that they dominate. They need the masochist or they need the, uh, the masochistic object. They need to rule, master, humiliate, and harm. Uh, in order to get rid of one's own feelings, to prove that one actually has something like strength, um, right? That that's the reason uh, uh, that you're engaging this act. It, it, in other words, being sadistic provides a kind of illusion, a user's illusion of mastery over others. I appear strong and therefore I suppress feelings of weakness and inadequacy by appearing strong and being tough and being a bully or whatever, okay? All right, so then there's often a cycle of sadomasochism in relationships that he writes about. Uh, romantic and familial love is often sadomasochistic dependence, right? So where a sadist and a masochist come together, not in freedom and mutual freedom, but they're coming together, one to control, one to be controlled, right? You often get a kind of a play of that. Um, I beat and dominate you because I love you. I love you because I beat and dominate you. These two things um, uh, go together, right? Because I am beaten and dominate. Yeah. So there's a social production of, uh, we'll leave that off, um, that gets us off into psychoanalysis. All right. So then he talks about this sadomasochistic parent-child relationship in the authoritarian family. This comes from Wilhelm Reich, from uh, Fromm's other work, from Horkheimer and Adorno's, uh, excuse me, Adorno and others, uh, great work on the, on the authoritarian of the authoritarian personality, that the family is sort of fits children for the bit of authoritarianism later in life. The harsh father, the punitive father, those kinds of things um, are part of doing this. So, all right, so page 146, he talks about the sexual perversion of sadomasochism. And again, that's just a tip of the iceberg. He's really not interested in sexual sadomasochism. Instead, that's just sort of a, um, a small element that 
exhibits itself in the sexual realm of a much bigger problem of psychological and cultural and social uh, authoritarianism, sadomasochism. Um, okay, so we can do that. So the masochist, I'm going to leave this out. So the masochist has sadism towards the self. The sadism has a uh, sort of uh, this drive, this harming drive towards others, uh, but both uh, can be argued to, to be in possession of the death drive. We can leave that out. Um, Wilhelm Reich, um, the masochist seeks pleasure and pain in, uh, as the, in, and pain is the price to attain it. So you're seeking pleasure, Reich says. You're not doing this to damage yourself necessarily, but you're doing it in order to, uh, uh, to get pleasure and, and the pain is the price to obtain it. Horni and Fromm, sexual perversion is the sexual version of moral masochism. So sadomasochist overcomes unbearable loneliness, powerlessness, and anxiety um, that is often not fully consciously felt. It's often denied, right? I'm strong. I'm going to do this anyway. But it's usually, it's, it's trying to mask and keep down an unconscious feeling of, of uh, powerlessness, loneliness, and anxiety. So quick, somebody control me. Uh, myself is a burden that I cannot endure. That's the masochist or quick somebody let me control them because myself is a burden. So I'm going to lose myself in my pleasurable control of other people. That's the sadist. So the masochist then seeks to get rid of the uh, of or vacuum out the self, get rid of the burden of freedom, right? So this is the masochist submitting to the big powerful thing, right? Submitting to someone or something that is felt or believed to be overwhelmingly strong, right? All right, trying to be recognized. If I submit enough, if I allow myself to be dominated, I'll be recognized by the thing, and then the thing will maybe give me something like uh, safety and security. So the big powerful thing could be a big person or thing, right? It can be a big God thing. It can be a God nation thing, a big political movement thing, um, right? Uh, a political movement, a political uh, uh, organization. Um, again, a religious thing, a religious organization, uh, and so on. So page 153, we develop ready-made masochistic strivings in cultural patterns. Um, he, again, he talks about um, you know, powerful, uh, painful, humiliating self-humiliation um, when we join uh, uh, sadomasochistic groups. You know, um, not quite so strong now, but when I was an undergrad, um, I know students who had really difficult times reacting to the sadomasochistic punishments that were uh, sort of meted out during um, uh, rush week. And where you know where pledges to a fraternity would be submitted to a variety of humiliations and physical punishments, and that and that that became part of the normal initiation process, hazing, I guess we call it, right? Right. So uh, so again, there's a lot of ready-made masochistic strivings built in. Um, all right. All right. We'll leave this off. Um, Okay, um, in the end, page 155, the sadist then, it wants to lose oneself and one's fear, anxiety, and loneliness and the feeling of power that comes from ruling over someone, forcing them to submit, uh, making them helpless, um, forcing them to do uh, what one pleases, right, to control, being in control, making people do things in a humiliating way just to do it, just to do it, to feel that sense of power, right, uh, to make them suffer, to inflict pain, uh, to have complete control over them. So again, uh, page 157 from warns about the symbiotic relationship between the masochist and the sadist. Um, each loses integrity through a merger. They become dependent upon other selves. They are, they, their self becomes dependent. So, uh, so the sadism is the active part. The masochist is the, pa is the passive part in this symbiotic complex. And again, this is what, it, again, passes for romantic love, especially immature romantic love uh, in, um, in American uh, popular culture, right? That I, I, I can't live without you. I, I must have you, uh, those kinds of things. I, 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 I will do anything for you. These kinds of things aren't expressions of freedom. They're not a guarantors of other people's freedom. Again, so this isn't positive freedom in the capacity for self-chosen love you know, um, in a way where you're enjoying your way uh, to sacrifice. Instead, this is, um, you know, again, sort of giving up freedom. All right. So the sadist then tries to dominate and punish the object. Uh, we're going to talk about the destroyer, wants to destroy the object. This is going to be really important later. Um, um, so page 159, uh, two people who are in love in a healthy relationship um, try to preserve the integrity, the equality, and the freedom of the other. Uh, whereas the sadomasochistic attachment, one person uh, tries to ride herd over another that they use or exploit or dominate. 
And so it, it perver it, it's not it's not mutual integrity, mutual freedom. My love for you isn't dependent upon your love. My freedom is dependent upon your freedom. Instead, it becomes this situation where both give up freedom in this uh, sadomasochistic attachment, and then they give up. Uh, the, they sort of mask on themselves the fear of, uh, of loneliness, of, of powerlessness, and so on. So that kind of personal structure where I give up my freedom to a loved one um, then can take on a larger political force when it becomes cultural or, uh, authoritarianism. So, um, so yeah, here we go. So a, a loving, uh, so like in colonialism, um, in um, imperialism, um, in something like fascism, um, the lust for power and domination over others, over some group, becomes dominant, and one submits to the group in order to get the authority to sort of punish some other group, to submit, force them to submit, to force them to control. Whereas in in a, in, in potency, in a, in a positive, loving relationship, you're trying to help the other have power to do something, to be able to accomplish self-chosen ends, mastery, and capability. So again, in a loving relationship, you're trying to help the other uh, be able to pursue their own self-chosen work, self-chosen love, self-chosen uh, play. And here you're trying to dominate so that no freedom uh, emerges, right? So uh, so these two things then are mutually exclusive it's on page 160. Being potent versus in sadomasochism or authoritarianism, the primary stance is impotence. Um, in the healthy relationship, the capable capability of mastery versus the lust for power. Uh, healthy relationship, the desire for freedom for self and others versus sadomasochistic submission, uh, fear of freedom for self and others. So that, again, positive freedom precludes authoritarianism authoritarianism precludes positive freedom these two things are really antagonists of, of, of each other and you find this expressed in the cultural realm you find it expressed in friendship networks and families people who have a strong authoritarian bent are strongly disapproving of those who have a strong uh, sort of what, what from would call a healthy uh, uh positive freedom right they really dislike people who are free and people who love freedom really don't want to give it up and are almost harmed by seeing other people who don't want it and who deprive it of other people. So it really is like having two species of human beings um, um, in close proximity to each other. And that, and, and again, it helps us understand that human beings are not very instinct-driven. We're really tight by social character, that social character displaces instinct. So... So that's important. So the authoritarian character then um, has unconscious drives and desires, dreams, fantasies, and so on um, that reveal sadistic and masochistic impulses. Uh, we'll kind of skip that. Uh, they're trying then, the main thing is, is that there's a constant search for authority. They want to submit to authority. So you know you have an authoritarian in your hands where they have a nose for power. They're trying to sniff it out. Who has it? How can I submit to the person who has it? And then how can I sort of obtain a piece of that that I can then use to work out my aggression on other people? So it's sniffing around for authority, sniffing around for power, right? Okay, um, so it wants to be an authority, wants to submit to authority, wants to have authority. So an authoritarian is always looking for power, right? So there tends to be a kind of um, interest in professions, in people who have authority, the ability to control other people. So there's a tendency towards something like policing as opposed to sort of social work, maybe a tendency towards military activity as opposed to, again, something like, you know, humanitarian activity or, you know, Peace Corps work, that kind of thing. So instead of lifting people up in, in, in positive freedom, it's a desire to submit to an authority structure to get a little bit of a borrowed authority that one can then use to work out aggression elsewhere. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so again, he's really worried about inhibiting authority. So it isn't that all authority is bad. Authority is good. It's just that there's a difference what he calls a rational authority, like the teacher-student relationship, versus the inhibiting authority of like the master and the slave. The difference is that the rational authority has a tendency to dissipate over time. There's a dialectic to it. So the teacher and the student begin with the teacher being strong and the student being weak. The teacher knows things 
is a master of a subject and the student is weak, doesn't know it. But as the pr pr relationship progressive progresses, they should be equal. So I just had a student this semester obtain her PhD. So she started her program in a position of, um, you know, I had authority over her. I no longer have any authority at all. She now is a doctor of philosophy and sociology. And so again, it, it's a it, rational authority um, helps the other become free, right? And gain the capacity for self-chosen work, love, and play. Inhibiting authority does the other thing, that it locks in. It tries to actually augment the differences in power that were there at the beginning. So rational authority, I hope by the end of a semester, my students are much closer in terms of their knowledge, that I have no authority over them. Um, but it, but an inhibiting authority is one where the uh, power tries to keep the powerless powerless, right? So again, you know you're, not, you're with an authoritarian when they don't want to provide the basic foundation for freedom. They want to keep people powerless and where having authority and maximizing authority over others is important. Maximizing weakness in other people is important as opposed to trying to, again, reduce those differences. So again, this is one of the ways where political um, um, reactionaries or political authoritarians, uh, you know, they really do find great comfort in inequality and structures of inequality and have no problem um, 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 keeping um, certain groups who are in the lower uh, 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 status layers uh, in a system of, uh, of inequality uh, there or limiting the kinds of, of in interventions that would aid people from getting out of low positions, class, race, um, gender, sexuality, um, uh, migrant status, and so on. And um, whereas, you know, progressive politics tends to want to lift people up, to give people the capacity for self-chosen work, love, and play to create, again, the conditions for a free society, something along those lines. So a good society to an authoritarian is one with usually something like rigid um, authority structures, rigid hierarchies, clear lines of authority, clear lines of power. Some people have power and use it over others, and that power doesn't dissipate, but it actually is, is maintained. Whereas a, a more progressive, pro -demo, not demo democratic party, but pro-democracy is where you're trying to lift people up and keep people uh, in possession of the basic um, uh you know, preconditions for self-chosen work, love, and play. Okay. All right. So authoritarian trade center talked about, um, okay. So uh, let's see. I actually have, I think, um, I think I'm going to stop here and we'll pick it up in the next uh, 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 recording. So in the next recording, we'll walk through some of the traits of the authoritarian character, and then we'll make a quick change to talking about the destructive character. I'll give a little bit more detail to it than what Fromm does in this book by talking about his book, The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness. And then we'll talk a little bit about, about automaton conformity and then about the possibilities for a, 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 a world of positive freedom uh, as opposed to negative freedom um, uh, that result from um, the conditions of late capitalism that we're in.